I now want to introduce tonight's keynote speakers, Rashad Robinson and Rinku Sen. Rashad Robinson serves as Executive Director of Color of Change, the nation's largest online civil rights organization. Under his leadership, Color of Change is at the forefront of issues, ranging from fighting for justice for Michael Brown and other young black men killed by police and vigilantes, to battling attempts to suppress the black vote. It was Color of Change that exposed the American Legislative Council's, or Alex involvement in passing discriminatory voter ID and shoot first laws. Rashad also serves on the board of the task force. His passion for justice is an inspiration. I am honored to call him a friend. And for those of us who know him well, we also know that he walks a fierce runway. <laughs> Rin Kusen is the president and executive director of Race Forward the Center for Racial Justice Innovation, and the publisher of the award-winning news site, Color Lines. <laughs> Rinku is one of the leading voices in the racial justice movement, building upon the legacy of civil rights by transforming the way that we talk about race. I first met Rinku in 1995, when she was a trainer at the Task Force's Youth Leadership Institute. As a young Latino, as a young Chicano person still developing my own racial analysis, Rinku became a guiding light on that journey. Her words, her actions, and her work transformed and informed my thinking and still do. And if you follow her on Instagram, at Rinku Writes, you also know that she can make knit a mean cap. Please welcome these two visionary leaders for tonight's dialogue about Ferguson on our minds. Oh, people like us, we've got to stick together. Keep your head up, nothing lasts forever. Here's to the damn, to the lost and the God. It's hard to get high when you're Hi, Rashad. Hey, Renko. Hey, hug. Okay, I know that does weird things to the mics. Yes. Hi, Creating Change. We're so happy to see you and to be with you and to see you right here. It's awesome. Yes. I and um, I want to first, um, once again, also thank the folks um, who took over the stage. In, in essence, we are actually having a conversation about taking over stages and streets and places where we're sometimes told not to be, and the movements and the opportunities to create real change that come out of that. And so the discussion that Rinko and I are gonna have is a discussion that probably so many of us continue to have in these moments when we ask ourselves, what more can be done? What more can we do um, in these moments? So we're gonna have this dialogue. We're gonna probably unearth some things that are um, challenges for us and maybe where we disagree, um, because that was the goal that the task force wanted here. And I also want to just start off by thanking the task force for having this discussion. There are a lot of LGBT spaces in our movement that would never create a stage to have this type of dialogue. <laughs> to put front and center, to put front and center these type of stories in these moments, and that is just a, one more reason why the task force continues to be a leader. Yeah, and. Uh, I work for Race Forward, and we do a uh, conference every other year because we're not quite as badass as the task force. We can't pull it off every year. And creating change is totally our inspiration, our model, our teacher, and we really see ourselves as building at Facing Race, the, the racial justice counterpart to this conference and this gathering. So. We're, we're here with family, right? This is family, we're family, Rashad and I are family. And we're gonna try to, we're gonna have just a very um, honest conversation about what's on our minds. Yes. Um, so I wanna start off by just saying that I'm struggling. Um, and um, I run a national civil rights organization that in moments where people are harmed or hurt by 
in law enforcement or by government, we are asked to respond. We're asked to mobilize and oftentimes use social media to give people something to do, oftentimes to ask people to engage and make sense of the world around them. And I'm struggling, and I started to struggle uh, with these, this issue shortly after um, you know, we, got no, we, got, we got no results in, um, in Sanford around Trayvon Martin. That time and time again, we ask the community to stand up and engage. And time and time again, the, the wheels and the, the, the institutes of justice do nothing. And, and I struggle because then another moment happens and we continue to ask people to respond and to engage. And it feels like we are, we are, we're in this vicious cycle where people are, are rallying and taking over streets, but we're not seeing any results, that we're not necessarily moving the needle. And then this moment around Ferguson happened. Um, and there was something very different. Um, I see some folks in the front row that, that, that really deserve a lot of credit for this, and there will be a, a deep conversation more tomorrow, on Saturday about that. But there was something different um, that happened on the ground. And, and, I, and, I, and I like to think about it in terms of this idea that we think about at Color of Change of moving cultural presence to cultural power. There's a difference between the type of presence that exists on issues where people are talking about them or thinking about them or maybe sharing something on social media, but there's a difference when we are starting to build a type of power that creates real change. When people who may not look like those impacting are willing to stand up for people that don't look like them and say, I care, and I'm willing to make action or make change. And the things I saw on the ground, the work that I saw on the ground in Ferguson with black young people at the center but folks of all races standing up to take action made me really inspired and reaffirmed that we do have a moment here to create some real change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a moment and we have, yeah, it's okay. We'll incorporate your applause into our conversation. Um, um, so I really identify with what you're saying about how we've, we've been through many cycles I've been through like 20 years more of many cycles than you have, and so I'm on like, I'm, I'm moving into my- She looks great my, though, I mean like- I, So yeah, yeah. after, you know, 25, 30 years, you get a little tired and you start to wonder, is, is this time gonna be the time? Is that time gonna be the time? And is this the moment where we're gonna actually be able to move something? And I think what happened when, with Ferguson, this is what happened, I think that there was a critical mass that had built up all across the country, and that the, um, you know, going through Tra the Trayvon Martin situation, going through Eric Garner, and for people of a certain age, you know, we're talking Eleanor Bumpers, and, you know, folks who were killed by police decades ago, who were still fighting for justice for those people, and uh, you do get tired. So, what was so significant about Ferguson for me was that as tired as we all were, everybody got on the street, everybody got on the bus. And it, we were able to actually respect, as a country, as a racial justice movement, we were able to respect the need that black people have to lead on an issue and in a situation where they, that was really centered on them. I think. What's so incredible about this moment in our racial politics is that we have a chance to really understand anti-blackness and for all of us to really get behind the goal of undoing anti-blackness. And it isn't, and we can do that and still build a multiracial racial justice movement and a multiracial social justice movement. There's no conflict between focusing on black people uh, for a time and in a place and around an institution and Absolutely. making things better for all of us, including the Jesse Hernandezes and, um, you know, the people who look like me, the South Asians and Muslims and Arabs who are regularly profiled and harassed and tortured, tortured uh, by the state. I, I agree with you. 
but I don't necessarily, but I, where I disagree is I don't think everyone is yet on the bus, uh -huh. right? And so everyone was not out in the street, and not that everyone needs to be out in the street, but everyone wasn't yet on the bus. Uh -huh. And as an organization that over and over again comes to these moments, um, what, was, what was inspiring was how the young folks drew a line in the sand and said, as enough is enough. But, but we should not ignore the generational issues that are existing around this moment. We cannot ignore the fact that there was more that white progressive movements could have done in this moment and should be doing in this moment. We can't just talk about 2020 and 2050 as some sort of magical time when progressives are gonna take over this country because diversity changes, and we don't actually care that people are dying in the process, that we have sort of this mass incarceration that is killing a whole generation of black and brown people. And it's why this type of conversation on this stage is so important, right? Because it is about transferring the presence of an issue and building the type of power necessary to win. The folks in this room, many of whom will never, will never, you know, have that moment when they're pulled over by a cop, when they walk past a police officer. They won't have that moment where they have to consistently code switch in between conversations or over explain themselves. They won't have this sort of opportunity cost of being black or brown in America. And so to the extent that I dream and hope for a day when everyone gets on the bus, we're not yet there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know that I... So that was a good catch. Everyone is not on the bus. Mm -hmm. Those generalizations, those wild, like, put them all together. Mm -hmm. But I have to tell you that there are people on the bus that I think black people didn't realize were on the bus. So for example, I was at my, um, at my auntie and uncle's house for Thanksgiving, right? My uncle is 82, my auntie's like 76. We have Thanksgiving dinner. And one of the ways that I know this movement is a movement is that um, it shows up at the kitchen table. We're an Indian immigrant family. My aunt and uncle grew up in India. They're elderly. We get through all of dinner. We've eaten all of dinner. And at the very end of dinner, my uncle says, well, what about Ferguson? And my auntie says, why are you bringing that up at the end? Why did you talk about that earlier? And I really think my uncle was just like working his way up to it. And he clearly was on our side. He was there, he had no question about like who was wrong and what needed to happen in Ferguson. And to the degree that it makes a difference that an Indian immigrant who is 82 and um, living in Queens cares, I, I, I want people to know that and I want my uncle to know that, yeah. that it makes a difference. I think it absolutely does. And I think that, and I think like to the extent, right, that these conversations are hard, that how do we deconstruct the anxiety that people get when they come into these conversations mm -hmm. where they feel like they may say the wrong thing, they, they avoid the context or the conversation. You know, I remember shortly after, um, after when I was at GLAD, shortly after uh, Prop 8 had passed, mm -hmm. and I would see tons of uh, both gay and ally friends, LGBT and allies, in the streets in Castro and West Hollywood and the village. And I'd oftentimes be like, no, you need to go home and talk to Aunt Edna um, around the holidays. Like, it's great to like show up for a rally in, in a community and, and, and not then bring that back to other, con so how do we get people to deconstruct how do we get people to open up and feel like they can have these conversations, that they can, if they are not part of the community, we, how do they get on the bus? How do we on-ramp people? Mm -hmm. So I think one thing is that we, when we are having those conversations, we are those, those people, we have to really be okay with people saying whatever they're gonna say. It's, it's hard, it's really, really hard. I don't wanna listen to it, I avoid it. Um, Sometimes you can't avoid it, but if I can avoid it, I tend to avoid it. But if they can't say it to us, people who love them and who um, are deeply embedded in the movements ourselves and have us um, engage wherever they are, 
then I think people are gonna go underground with their feelings. And sometimes their feelings are gonna be progressive and in our direction, and sometimes they're not. But either way, I think we have to stay in the conversation and that requires so much calm and inner strength, emotional strength, and um, meditation. So the thing that I struggle with is that I get really tired and I'm, I'm not that patient a person in general, so I get sarcastic and impatient. And, um, and what I've come to understand is that when I do, when, if I can prevent that, if I can prevent myself from going over the patient's edge, if I can listen a little bit longer, keep the person talking a little bit longer, sometimes they'll question their way all up in my direction. And they'll, they'll make the connections for themselves, partly just because I'm sitting there and they want to do the right thing by me. People know what my politics are and they know the kind of work I do. And um, sometimes if I just let them talk, as hard as it is for me to hear, if I try not to shut them down, we can get somewhere. One thing, yeah, yeah. One, one thing that I heard sort of throughout this whole moment around um, Ferguson and, and Staten Island um, was how many people, um, and, and folks in this audience might have an experience, how many people were deleting people from their social media? Oh yeah, right, exactly. Right? More like, liberals than yes, conservatives yes. Like do how that. Many, how many, yeah, people, how many people were deciding sort of, you know, this is either polluting my space, I'm going to block you, I'm going to prevent you from being able to do certain things on my page, I can no longer deal with this. Or they were sort of having a great deeper understanding of how certain people who maybe were in their lives for years felt about things and were maybe surprised. Um, and, and in that, in, in that it, it feels like a, almost a, a sort of a, a direct contradiction to, to what you're trying to get at mm -hmm. here in terms of being able to have these conversations. If we, if we, right, in this room I heard some claps of people who sort of couldn't, couldn't handle the folks on their, on their pages or in their Twitter feeds. If we can't sort of be in those conversations with people, then who will? If we, um, right, if, if we decide that we are going to sort of like cut those folks out of our lives, and sometimes certain people probably need to be cut out, but if we're not going to engage in the dialogue, then what is the work? Mm -hmm. Right. I do think that there's, there is judgment to be made. I mean, you don't have to keep talking to somebody who's abusive. So, you, you know, you want to be able to judge, is this person really just honestly trying to understand and, and interested in conversation, or is this person really just about to abuse my humanity and dismiss me? And, and you know, we have to, like, have some, um, some protection. But I think what I'm saying is that mostly we're not going to die from a conversation and unless our blood pressure really gets like excessive, but that mostly happens to people over 50. So, um, so if you're over 50, like watch your blood pressure while you're having the discussion. Blood pressure comes with age, I know this. Uh, I'm not saying that um, older people have uh, less wherewithal to be in the conversation by any means. We should just keep going. Let we me just keep, keep going. going. Yeah, just keep going. The keep point going. is, <laughs> I think the point is that you don't have to like put up with abuse in that conversation. And, but there's a lot that gets said that is way short of that, but still upsetting to us. And, and we can, we're gonna be okay. We have the strength to, to uh, get through that. So this is a big tent. This room is mm -hmm. a big tent. Um, our community is a big tent. And this is the opening conversation of this conference. And it is about Ferguson on our minds. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a community where, where, um, where, you know, last year we saw, um, you know, tra more trans women being murdered than, than any other year that we sort of have documented. We, we um, continue to see states where gay and trans people can be fired for their jobs with no protections. Mm -hmm. um, we continue to see um, you know, hate crimes and, and brutality happening with no sort of results. 
why should Ferguson be on this conference mind? Like, why should people in this room care about Ferguson when there seems to be so much pain? Uh, wh what's the connection? Let's, ex let's, let's break this down for folks. Let's walk this through because we're in a big tent, and I know while there's some people who get, get it instinctually and can walk us through it, there are some people who are probably asking why are we having this conversation, and we should talk that through. So one reason why we should be having this conversation in spaces that are prime, you know, about sexual liberation and LGBTQ rights is certainly one is that uh, queer people, trans people, trans people of color. Uh, my friend uh, Barbara Major used to say that any problem gets worse if you throw some color on it. So take any problem, put a little color on it, see if it doesn't get 10 times worse. So that is as true, I think, for uh, on sexuality as it is on race. That, you know, having a non-heteronormative sexuality and being not white makes you extra, extra, super vulnerable to institutions that have bias. So if we want to solve problems, if we want to solve policing problems, if we want to solve problems in healthcare and education, we have to be about solving problems for everybody because if you leave a little opening in, an, in a system so that somebody can be abused through that opening, even if you have solved the problem supposedly for 90% of people and you still have that 10% that, uh, that is still vulnerable, that means that the 90% are always going to be vulnerable, that that opening can always be broadened. So one reason for us to focus on a Ferguson is because Ferguson is operating on the very margins of our society at this point. And if we don't bring them into the center, we are all vulnerable in one way or another. Certainly queer people are vulnerable. The second thing I want to say about this, though, is, you know, LGBTQ people, when I was thinking about this earlier, why, why does it matter? Why does Ferguson matter in this crowd? Um, there are two words came to my mind. Those two words were raids and AIDS. So LGBTQ people know what it is, what it means, what it feels like, and what effect it has on your life to have the state do violence on your body. I feel like so many people have forgotten that, have forgotten that sort of history that the LGBT movement has had with policing in this country, has had with um, a across, across economic classes across race, the history of sort of police misconduct, police brutality on this community, and that some people have walked through the door, not all the way through the door, but some people have walked through the door, and, and, and there are times in which they forget that, that, that the community is not all there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, besides, in addition to police brutality, the reason I mentioned AIDS is because that is, that is about a system, the early reactions to AIDS, so AIDS uh, became a thing when I was a teenager, late teens, and Ronald Reagan was president. And, and the Reagan administration did its absolute best to ignore it, to, they, they starved the institutions that should have been researching and treating and taking care of people with AIDS. They starved those institutions of resources. And that is a form of violence done on the body. You know, it's either violence by aggression, the police shoot you, or violence by neglect, the system ignores you and doesn't get you what you need. And just, I, I do think it's important in all of our um, in, uh, clear analysis and all of our excellent strategizing that's based on really being able to see the landscape as it actually is, it's important for us to act also bring our humanity and to make those connections, not just because we need each other to win things, and not just because uh, you know we are suffering from the same kinds of problems, but because we are human, mm -hmm. and you, you have to feel some empathy for people who are um, suffering the effects of, of that kind of state violence. And I think what's important about this moment is that it's not just about empathy, because empathy doesn't win you battles. People feeling sorry for you doesn't win you right. battles. People seeing you as powerful, powerful and capable. And so, you know, when I, when I, 
I was the head of programs at GLAAD a number of years ago. When I left to run Color of Change, I would oftentimes have this joke with people when they would ask me questions about GLAAD after I'd already left. And I would say, um, I'm black now. I used to, I'm not gay anymore. I'm black. Um, <laughs> or just today, for yeah, this hour, today, for this, yeah, at like, this I'm meeting like, I used to be gay, now I'm black. And um, so inspired by folks like, like, like Ashley and like Brittany and like Alexis and so many of the young folks that have led from an intersectional perspective have brought their whole selves to the table. The, the activists, the young powerful activists in Ferguson. <laughs> Queer people have always been part of these movements. Absolutely. Right? Like, this is nothing new, but we are in a different age of participation where we don't have to wait for sort of the single sort of male, straight messiah that's gonna save us, you know, and bring us to the promised land. We are in a participation age where leadership can look and feel different and people can have a different voice, sometimes powered by social media, sometimes powered just by this, I believe, the sort of new age of how millennials think about the world. And it's incredibly exciting to see people willing to like push back against power, willing to challenge power in our own communities and structures in our own communities, but willing to be unapologetic about sort of who they are and where they are in, the, in, in this movement and bringing their whole selves to the table. And for myself, you know, running the organization that I run, it's been incredibly inspiring for me. Um, even while being challenged by these moments to see a new type of activism that has built up to push back and fight back. And so when I think about Ferguson being on my mind, I think about the changing face of activism in this country and how proud we should all be that that activist is, activism is centered in a new type of courage. Mm -hmm. A courage about sort of each of us being able to bring our individual selves to the table. And I know it's not easy for folks, but I believe it's empowering and it's inspiring and it's something that we should all be trying to support. Yeah, and it's also, it's also, so, some of the ways that I know this movement is a movement, I mentioned the kitchen table, but there are other ways. So lots of decentralized leadership, lots of spontaneous action, the sheer size of the protests, the number of them, the endurance of them, all of those things indicate to me that we are in a time of social upheaval, social and political and cultural and economic upheaval, and that these are movements that rival the, the movements of the 1960s, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the peace movement of the 60s, the labor movement of the 1930s. And so it does, it is different now than my work was a year ago even because that was, we were in pre-movement a year ago and now we're in movement. And so this scale and the pace of things and the attacks back on us are going to intensify deeply from here. I'm, I'm already so tired, but I don't know. I try to get my six hours of sleep every night and like keep going because it's pretty clear that this is not the moment to take a break. Uh, I mean, really, if you really need a break. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you took a vacation over the holidays and like flew away somewhere and took cooking classes and Thank things you. like that. Yeah. I spent my holidays watching Netflix and knitting and thinking about not too much else. Um, but the resources are never gonna be enough. The scale is going to have to be big and it's gonna just keep getting bigger. And we need to gear ourselves up for five, 10 years that in which I think we can reform police departments all over the country. I think we can make, we can create a new paradigm of public safety and community safety that vastly uh, re-envisions the role of the police. Now it's true, white folks are gonna have a harder time with that because they grew up uh, every year while they were kids hearing this message, if you ever get lost, go find a policeman. It's clearly not a message that, <laughs> you know, our kids are gonna get. But, so we have a lot of work to do to re-characterize police and police departments in the, in the white imagination in particular, but also in the middle class imagination and so on. But, but we can do that. So, so you know, 
every day I'm all in for this policy change, right? Um, you know, we, my organization, I testified in front of the President's Commission on Police Reform last week. We have delivered petitions to the White House. We are pushing the Justice Department. But there are limitations, right, to policy. You know, in fact, none of these policies are actually going to prevent a police officer from, like, hurting or harming any of us. Mm -hmm. They may create greater accountability and maybe some behavior change down the line, but we also have this cultural problem in this country around who is valued, who is important, who should be respected that will never be solved with policy change. And, and this movement, more than any, should really recognize that, that, that even when, when the 50-state the strategy is done on a certain set of policies, there will be a wide range of experiences that people have every single day in their lives based on their perceived, their value and worth, their perceived value and worth they have to our society. And so, so, so how do we leverage this moment around that? You know, what, what do we do? What do we do around that? Because what I, what I also struggle with is selling people on the silver bullet of policy. That if we just, that if the President Obama just signs this piece of like bill, that everything will be fine and racism will be over and we can like all go back to like being happy because that's what we were before all this right. happened. Right, before the police killed yes. our family members. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I just think that we, we can't, we have to hold politics and culture together. And, you know, if you're a professional activist, like you and I are, uh, or a professional organizer, then I think it's, um, it's easy to forget that all those, you know, all of our conversations about these things, about race and about why black lives matter, like, why would we say black lives matter and not all lives matter? Like, why is all lives matter so damn upsetting uh, and such a like wrong thing to say in this context, um, those conversations don't happen largely in professional settings, you know? They happen in the school cafeteria and they happen uh, at the bus stop and they happen, you know, when somebody's at the gym wearing their t-shirt and somebody else makes a comment. And I think we have to equip ourselves and our people, all of our people, my uncle, to um, have those conversations and to make art that, that elevates black lives and to um, do the, write novels that do that and make movie scripts that do that and write tweets that do that because those are all of the things that tell people how they could think, how they could think about black people, um, and how they could stop thinking about black people. And, and, in, and in so many ways, it's the thing that each of us can do and our own actions every single day, regardless of sort of what our previous experiences are. It can be our value add to this moment, right? Not everyone is going to work for an organization that's working on these issues every day. Mm -hmm. And not everyone in this room is going to show up to a protest. But it's what we do in those moments when we have an opportunity to stand up and say something, to push back, mm -hmm. to, to share a perspective, to volunteer, to engage. It's how, this, how moments that are present, the cultural presence around these moments where people are standing up and watching and paying attention and asking what we can do. It's how we translate that into type of cultural power so we can look back five or 10 years from now and say this is the moment when we start to get ourselves on the road to change. It, this was the moment where, where we stood with people who did not look like us or may not have the same experiences as us, but we stood with them because we believed that we could work together to build a better tomorrow. Yeah, forget five, 10 years from now, Rashad. 50 years from now, 100 years from now, people are going to be reading the stories of Ferguson activists, reading about this conference, watching these tapes, and um, using that as fodder for the fights that they ha are getting ready to have. We're done. We're done. Thank you all very much.